Have your Bible turn 2 Chronicles chapter 7 this morning with me, verse number 14. Should be very familiar to all of you. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter number 7 and verse number 14. The Word of God says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Father, bless this holy book now. It's thy word, Lord, not mine. It's thy word. Father, you know I'm nothing but a messenger. That's all I want to be. That's all. And I'm so glad and so thankful that I can stand and proclaim your name and your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> it was the darkest hours of World War II. Nazi Germany was firing V-1 and V-2 missiles across the English Channel. They were landing on London, killing people by the thousands. The people would dig out each morning from the previous night's bombing. They had a leader during that period of time. His name was Winston Churchill. He was a wartime prime minister. Now, uh, being a wartime prime minister, uh, he was politician, no question, but he was also a father figure for those people. He was somebody that they had to look to for strength and leadership and and, uh, and uh, unwavering decisions that had to be made. And they believed that Winston Churchill stood with them in the face of the aggression of Nazi Germany and that Winston Churchill would be there with them regardless of what came, and he was. Winston Churchill stuck with them through World War II all the way through the darkest hours. But he made a statement while he was the Prime Minister of Great Britain that I'll never forget. And I'm sure that if you've watched any History Channel or read any, any statements from history, somewhere along the line you've heard the statement that Winston Churchill made, and it was this, that is our finest hour. He was talking about the fact that uh, Great Britain was going through a trying time that was going to change them, and it was going to bring the best out of them, and it was going to bring them together as a people, and that this time would be a learning time so therefore they would rise above whatever petty differences that they might have had and it might create within them something that would be wonderful in humanity, courage and the fact that they would help each other and that to look to Almighty God to get them through the dark hours of World War II. I remember also reading that uh, during the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor that we had thousands of men die. The USS Arizona lies at the bottom to this very day still seeping oil to the top, 1,500 plus of our young men went down with that thing when it was bombed from aircraft carriers and fighter bombers that flew over Pearl Harbor December the 7th, 1941. The next day, Franklin Delano Roosevelt got up and said to the Congress, a state of war has existed between the United States of America and Japan. But the thing that strikes me most uh, about what happened at Pearl Harbor is what Admiral Yamamoto said, for he was the architect of that assault that killed all of those men and women down there at Pearl Harbor. The architect of all of that made this statement. Yamamoto was a smart man. He was an admiral, and he made this statement. He said, I fear that we've awakened a sleeping giant. He was right. They did awake a sleeping giant. America was never the same after Pearl Harbor. This past Friday, the Supreme Court of the United States of America met nine justices, and they came to a final decision, passed it down five, four, and four against, making it the law of the land that uh, homosexuals or sodomites or gay or whatever you want to call them can unite now in holy matrimony, and so therefore marriage has become the law of the land. It's the federal law, therefore it governs all the states of this union and so therefore, if that happened, and I'll tell you right now, I grieved. I've never grieved over anything like I grieved over that because I knew something profound had happened to the United States of America. I do. I do. I knew something had happened. So I went through a couple of days of grieving. And I went a couple of days of soul searching. And I went through a time of asking God, now what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Looking in my heart and my soul and saying, now, Lord, you know what they've done. You know what the federal government has done? 
but what are we going to do? Yeah. And of course, it first came to my mind, God said, now, son, it's not about the Supreme Court. It's not about the governor of Tennessee. It's not about the mayor of Knoxville. He said the pillar and ground of the truth is the church of the living God. That's what he told me. And you know, that's what the Bible says. And the Bible says that judgment must begin first at the house of God. That's us. You see, my friend, we're the light of the world, not the Supreme Court. We're the salt of the earth, not that crowd up there. It is his church that has invested the truth. He gave us his holy word. Supreme courts come, Supreme courts go. Presidents come, presidents go. Nations come, nations go. That book has been around for thousands of years. That book will be around when America is nothing but an ash heap in history. I pray for America. I don't want to see America's demise. I want to see this country prosper. This country sent out missionaries to the four corners of the earth at one time. The Great Awakening took place in America under the preaching of George Whitfield and others. And my friend, the Great Awakening moved this nation and was very instrumental in the establishing of our nation as to what it is to this very day. We're reaping the benefits of the Great Awakening. God has blessed America. If you've ever lived in a country where God has blessed it, it's America. I want you to understand today that you are reaping the benefits of hundreds of years of blessing from Almighty God. And so, my friend, I got up this morning and I got my message together to what to preach. And I believe in all my heart that God's laid something on my soul that you need to hear. This may very well be the church's finest hour. This may be a moment where the church rises to what it ought to be. This church in America may become what Yamamoto said, waking a sleeping giant. It could be that the forces of hell have stirred the pot too many times. It could be that they've pushed a little bit too hard. It could be that they've got their way and they don't realize what their way is going to produce. For if I believe if there are millions of Christians in this country, if there are millions of born-again believers in America, my friend, they have wakened a sleeping giant. It could be that for the first time since America has been a nation, that those people that name the name of Christ will finally come together and say we do have a common enemy. We've got a purpose. We've got a call. We've got a goal. And is there not a cause? Is there not a cause today? Has not enough happened to stir you up? Or what else needs to be done? Do they need to come through the door and take your kids and carry them out the back door and say they're ours now? We're going to turn them into sodomites and homosexuals and all of that. What will it take to awaken the church in America? I believe it's starting to wake up. I believe in a time, it's time, and this time, it is this time. It's the time now that we need to speak and do what we're called to do. For this hour, we've been brought to this world. For this time, we're here in America in 2015. I just happened to be preaching here in 2015. God had a reason to put me here in this church. I've lived 68 years in this world. I thank God for every day I've lived. I thank God for saving my soul. But I'll tell you right now, my friend, I will not swap. I will not trade. I will not give in to what God's given me and bow under the hand of a federal government that's trying to make a slave out of you. These are not empty derogatory statements. I'm not a politician. I'm not running for office. My life in Christ is far more important to me than what some Supreme Court judge has to say. But I firmly believe this this morning. I'm not alone. I believe there are thousands of men in this country and women who feel the same way I do. I believe there are people in this country who've been waiting for something to happen to give them a cause. The church, friend, has been asleep. But thanks be unto God, maybe it's waking up. You'll find out in the near future. You'll find out when they go to the polls in November. You'll find out when the politicians, as they march across the stage and engage in their debates, you'll find out the position that they take. We'll ask them simple questions. Our salvation is not of the politician, but if you knowingly put a devil in office, then you knowingly accept what he does. We're citizens of this country. I put four years in the military. I paid my dues. I've got a right to go vote. And so do you. And go to the polls and go in there as an informed voter and vote. But the greatest voting you'll ever do 
is on your knees when you cry out to God and say, Lord God, you've given us an opportunity. You're giving an opportunity to this nation to purge the church of God. You see, when the enemy raises up against us and the enemy creates his flood and sends it out against the people of God, the Bible says the Lord will raise up a standard against them, and I am under that standard. Let me tell you something, folks. I'm going to tell you the end in the beginning. We're on the winning side. Amen. He said, if the gates of hell try to prevail against the church of God, they will never do that. He right. said his church will never fail, and he'll have, he's never failed me, and he hasn't failed you. Right. Now, let me give you some scriptures this morning for those of you that vacillate and waver, and you're not too sure about this or about that. Here's what the Bible says. In the book of Leviticus, chapter number 18, verse number 22, there is no mistaking this scripture. It is as clear as it can possibly be. In Leviticus 18, verse 22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind from the mouth of God himself. It is an abomination. In Levit Le Leviticus chapter number 20 and verse number 13, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Somebody said all sin is sin. They don't kill you for all sin. Every sin in the Bible doesn't carry the death penalty. Every sin in the Bible is not rated the same. But the sin of homosexuality, of, of sodomy, however you want to classify it, in the word of God, it is an abomination, a sin worthy unto death. That's the Old Testament. Look what the apostle says in Romans chapter number 1. In the book of Romans chapter number 1, verse number 27, the apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome, which was, as you can read what some of the historians have to say, some of the most wicked, vile, godless perversion reprobate took place in Rome and blow your mind. Yes. And so when the apostle writes them, he says this in verse 27, Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was made. Does anybody this morning have any trouble understanding that? I mean, folks, you get a 10-year-old kid can understand what's going on here. This is not talking about a temple prostitute. This is not talking about some spin that you put them some theological uh, dictate or treatise. This is as clear and simple as it can be. When a man is with a man, it's an abomination. When a woman is with a woman, it's an abomination. I didn't write that. They're pro Listen, the controversy is not with me. I'm nothing. I'm here today, I'm gone tomorrow. Amen. The controversy is with the word of God. Amen. And when the tyrant tries to stamp out the word of God, he only spreads it. Amen. When he begins to persecute the church of the living God, he only strengthens it Amen. and purifies it. And he awakens a sleeping giant. God help us today to wake up. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 9, it makes this statement, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Now what follows is the list. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. And here are two words, effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. You can go home and look these up in the Greek lexicon. Get Strong's Concordance. Effeminate is a catamite. If you don't know what a catamite is, go home, Google it. It'll tell you what a catamite is. The second one is an abuser themselves with mankind. What's that? Sodomite. It's both connected, but one has to do with an age and a situation. Go look it up for yourself. But in both cases, it condemns sodomy. That is in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 1 and verse number 10. 1 Timothy 1, 10. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, the same word again, sodomite, homosexual, for men stealers, liars, perjurers, so forth and so on. The scripture, therefore, is, and this is just a few, there are the references, historical incidences in the book of Judges and places here and there of how they dealt with this stuff, but this is the, script, the clear teaching of scripture as to what it has to say about sexual perversion. 
Now somebody said, well, the preacher, you don't love these people. If I don't tell you the truth, I don't love you. Amen. If there's a furnace out there waiting to consume you and I don't warn you about that furnace, I don't love you. The word love is thrown away. Let me tell you something else, too. I love my son. I love my daughter. I love my grandson. I love my granddaughter. Speaking in the sense, I don't have a son. I don't have a grandson. But I've got grandchildren. I've got a daughter. If I love them, I'm going to tell them the truth. Amen. 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 And if you don't tell them the truth, your definition of love is a mushy bunch of junk. So the scripture's clear. There is no doubt in the word of God. So our position as Bible believers, listen carefully, if you could let something like this pass and fly over the top of your head and agree and go with the flow, not take a position of what the Bible has to say, then do you not understand that what's going on right now is a direct assault on the authority and integrity of the Word of God? If you can embrace sodomy, then might as well throw this thing out for it doesn't mean a thing. That's as clear as it can be. So if you understand what's happening today, then you understand the real essence of the battle. You know they've been talking about ISIS over there and all this and that going on there for months. And these generals, and you need to listen to the generals, forget the politician, listen to the generals. And the generals tell you, you first have to identify your enemy. When you identify your enemy, then you create a strategy. How are you gonna deal with this? All right. And this is what's going on now. We've got to identify the enemy and the problem. The enemy's the devil. His tactic is to destroy the integrity of the word of God. And if he can do that, folks, this is just, let's turn it into a bingo house, bingo parlor. Let's uh, come in here and, and just, you know, play games because it's no longer the church. As the Bible goes, so goes the church. If the Bible, therefore, is destroyed, the church will be destroyed. He said, but my word is forever settled in heaven. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But what did he say about his word? His word abideth forever. And so, therefore, we believe the Bible. America's been going through culture wars. How many of you understand that? You know what a culture war is about? What's a culture war? A culture war is when they have when the, when a whole country goes against everything that you hold precious that you believe from Scripture. The whole country's turned against it. Now, when I say whole country, I speak in a general sense because there are millions in this country who don't accept the present culture. Here are three biggies: 1963, 63, they, 64 rather. They took prayer out of school. That started the downhill slide. 1973, in the Roe versus Wade decision, they went to, they, they, her name was McCorvey, and they ruled in her favor against Wade, who was the prosecutor in, the, in, in, I think it was a county in Texas or somewhere. And because of that, they legalized abortion in America. 57 million right now, to date, 57 million innocent little babies have paid the price. No politician paid the price. They didn't pay any price. No professor paid any price. All of these talking heads babbling, babbling, babbling about a woman's right over her body, they didn't pay any price. But 57 million little babies never saw the light of day. They paid the price. Does anybody speak for them? Does anybody say a word for those 57 million little babies? They're gone. Believe this, you'll see them. God's got a special place in heaven for those 57 million little babies. But that continued the downward slide. Then June the 26th, 2015, this past Friday, the ruling came down from the Supreme Court 51 years after Roe versus Wade, where the Supreme Court now endorses sodomite marriage. What has America become? Some say America is the prophesied Babylon in the book of Revelation, the Old Testament. I won't argue with that. Here are some of the reasons they say it's so. And here are some of the things for you to think about. How do you interpret Bible prophecy? We call that, uh, we call that uh, eschatology, the doctrine of last things. How do you interpret Bible prophecy? Do you believe the Bible has something to say about man's future and about the things are they as they transpire today? Yes, it does. The Word of God looks into the future. The Word of That's one of the things that sets God's Word apart is the fact that it, it is full of prophecy. 
300 prophecies fulfilled in the birth of Christ and yet are more yet to be fulfilled than were fulfilled in his birth. Here are some of the things you need to understand about the interpretation of the Bible. Number one, Israel in the Old Testament was used again as prophecy relating to Christ in the New Testament. In plain words, in the Old Testament, he said, I'll call my son out of Egypt. That was a direct reference to Israel. But the New Testament writer used that and applied it to the Lord Jesus Christ when he came back out up out of Egypt. So it had a double reference and it had a greater fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist could have been the Elijah the prophet, the Lord Jesus said. John the Baptist, when he was here 2,000 years ago, the Lord said, this is Elijah if you'll receive him. Well, John the Baptist was not Elijah, but he could have fulfilled the prophecy of Elijah. So you see how another person can replace someone else. This is the way God does things. Then we have Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt in the book of Revelation. Well, we know that Jerusalem is not literally Sodom and Egypt, but in the sight of God, Jerusalem is Sodom and Egypt. I wonder what he thinks about Washington, D.C. right now. I wonder, since Jerusalem is Sodom and Egypt spiritually, don't you think America could be Sodom and Egypt spiritually? Oh, yes, it could. Yes, it could. So one person can stand for another, and one place can stand for another. So the prophecies of Babylon in the Old Testament and in the New Testament book of Revelation could be a reference to America. Could be. Yes, it could. There's a striking resemblance between the modern New York City map and whether you superimpose the ancient Babylonian empire over it. It's amazing how they're so close together. Spiritually, the United States, as I said just a moment ago, is Sodom and Egypt, no question. America is definitely the crossroads of merchandising. Did you understand that the American dollar is still the reserve currency of the world? Uh, not too many years in the past, it was the British pound sterling, but today it is the American dollar. What does that mean, preacher? It means that your interest rates are, are held low because the American dollar is valuable everywhere. It's the reserve currency of the world. But it won't always be. Here's another, here's another way to say it. Trading, buying, and selling, we are the ones they traffic through. We're the ones who set the standard and the rate. You ever heard of Wall Street? And Wall Street controls the buying and selling and the price fixing of everything. It relates to Wall Street. America fits. Oh, yes. Babylon talks about it being the one where the, the, the merchandisers and the sellers of the world, they watch it as it burns. And so America's past shows the involvement of occult forces when this country was established. In the layout of Washington, D.C., it was laid out by occult forces, occult powers. In our money, look at a dollar bill. It's all occultic on both sides. And then in the harbor, Statue of Liberty it has its roots in the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. All that in America. So then, preacher, are you saying then that America, according to the scriptures, if America is Babylon, that it's going to be destroyed? It may very well be. Yes, it may very well be. But there's only one thing that can preserve America. Just one thing. What's that, preacher? That's the church of God. Amen. That's you. Amen. That's you. That's you. Amen. That's you. If you're part of the church, if you're really born again, listen to this statement right here. Let this settle in for a moment. This is Joel Osteen. 45,000 people he gets up in front of week after week after week. I have nothing personal against him. He is the poster boy of religion in America. That's why I'm using him. The, the, the emerging church movement in this country, Rick Warren is part of it. A lot of you people out there, you're buying their books and you're sending money to them. God help you, you ought to get right with God. Amen. You need to repent. Amen. Amen. You need to repent. <laughs> buying their books and sending them money. But here, the emerging church hates doctrine. It's all about a feeling. It's all about being controlled when you go into their, into their, by the atmosphere, the ambiance of the place that you're going to. The music, the lights, the mist, and all this stuff is going on where you feel something good. It doesn't make any difference how you're living. You feel good. And that is the emerging church. They, want, they do not want doctrine because doctrine establishes you in something. It causes people to understand, I believe this. I believe Christ is the only way to God. I 
nothing that's got to be washed in the blood or your sins will not be forgiven. I believe that. There's no other way. But here's what he says when confronted with the issue of homosexuality. Here's what he said. He said, God absolutely approves of everyone, including homosexuals, declared one of America's most well-known evangelical pastors. Continuing, absolutely, he insisted. I believe that God has breathed his life into every single person. We're all on a journey. Nobody's perfect. There's that relativism. And with relativism, there is no absolutism. And without an absolute, there is no foundation. It's relative. Osteen, who oversees a congregation of 45,000, stated all people must be acknowledged for who they are and expressed reluctance to categorize sin. Continuing, now listen carefully. I believe every person is made in the image of God, and you have to accept them as they are on their journey. I'm not here to be preaching hate, pushing people down. I'm not here telling people what they're doing wrong. Here's the problem. Man was made in the image of God, but that image fell. If you go back and study the book of Genesis, listen carefully to me now, you'll find out that every person after Adam was born in the image of his father, not in the image of God. The image was tarnished from that day on. But when you go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number one, begin to study the New Testament, you'll find the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. He was the express image of God. In plain words, he was the perfect representation of Almighty God in flesh and that we have been made anew in his image. Hallelujah. Now I just gave you some theology. That comes from studying the Bible. You'll never get it from a guy like this. Because he uses image in a general sense. We're all in the image of God. We're all here on the same journey. We're all sinners. So it really doesn't make that much difference in how you live. We're all going on and love will take, take us all the way home. The problem, see, I'm not here to make fun of this man. I'm here to try to wake you up. He sells thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of books. And he represents the emerging church movement. According to the book of Revelation, he represents the whore. For in Revelation 17, the whore rides the back of the Antichrist. The political power of the Antichrist and the religious power of the whore are joined together. Like any politician, the Antichrist uses the influence of the whore to build his base. Once he has established his absolute control and power, the Bible says in Revelation, he turns against the whore. So I warn you right now, if you're part of the emerging church movement, you're going to fly and sail on. You're going to, it's going to, you're going to run fast and high. It's all going to be hunky-dory until he turns against you. And let me tell you this too. Be careful. You're going right smack into the tribulation period, right into it. You're going to be right smack in the middle of the tribulation period. You're going to miss the rapture of the church of God because you don't belong to the church of God. This is what I'm talking about in the message this morning. It's the church's finest hour. I believe it's an hour when revival can really come. You know, these guys have been talking about revival, been praying for revival. They're talking about their little meetings they have this spring and in the fall. They don't want revival. But when God gets ready to send a real revival, he's going to shake things. And when he sends a real revival, you're going to see something really change and really happen to the church. And that'd be the most wonderful thing in the world, to see him purge the church, to watch people walk this aisle and really get right with God, and to see the power that rises up inside the early New Testament church is for us today to see people healed and delivered and saved right on the spot like that man that fell out of his bed and got on his face. You know why he did that? He got to the end of himself. And the moment he got to the end of himself, that's where God met him. And that's where he saved him when he came to the end of himself. We need a revival. Oh, yes, and God will send a revival in a way that you can't imagine. So, yes, he's coming. He's coming and he's coming again. Thanks be unto God. I am encouraged. Now, you say, well, preacher, it's strange how you get encouraged. I'm telling you, I'm encouraged this morning because I see the hand of God in it. God gives you the kind of, of leadership that you deserve. 
He gives you the kind of politicians you deserve. He gives you the kind of government you deserve. But somewhere along the line, like Pharaoh said, one more night with the frogs. But there finally was a night when Pharaoh got fed up with the frogs. Amen. He'd had enough frogs. Some of you, are they croaking loud enough for you? Are you getting tired of the frogs? We're getting close to the end. Now listen to these two young men right here. Fine young men. One of them is a medical doctor and the other one is, I don't know exactly his, his background. They are both representatives from the state of Tennessee. These are state house representatives put in office by the people of Tennessee. Two Tennessee state representatives were set to introduce a Pastor Protection Act after the Supreme Court of the United States ruling on same-sex marriage. Representative Byron Brian, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, Representative Brian Terry from Murfreesboro and Representative Andy Holt from Dresden have been working on the bill for the last several months in anticipation of the Supreme Court ruling. I make a motion that one of them run for president and I make a motion the other one run for vice president. And we'll put them in office. They're looking out for the pastors in the country particularly in the state of Tennessee. Amen. Now, there's a fellow up there named Donald Trump. Yeah. He's got a filthy mouth. I've heard him use some words that, I, that just peel the bark off of the wall. He's not running for pastor of America. He's running for president of America. Would Donald Trump make a good president? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I know this. I love my country. Somebody said Monday, when, it, when is the fourth? When's that coming? Saturday, Saturday. and what birthday, 239? It is the 239th birthday of this republic, this coming Saturday, all right? 239 years. Now folks, in the scheme of history, America is a baby, 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 baby. There are cultures and people that are thousands of years old. We just showed up. But Abraham Lincoln stood at Gettysburg. And at the end of that horrible battle that lasted, I think, three days, four days, brave men on both sides died. And they were fighting over ideology, over issues, over things that mattered. Well, he gave what's called the Gettysburg Address. I learned it in high school. I've since forgotten some of it. But he said, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. Right. Now we have met on a, a great battlefield. And, uh, and, and I, like I told you, I can't remember the words verbatim, but he says something to this effect. He said, it is beyond our poor power to add or detract from what they have done. In plain words, they've paid for their testimony and their witness with their very blood all right now here's what he said he said this battle was fought to determine whether a nation so conceived and so dedicated could long endure do you remember those words and the nation hadn't been around long this was in 18 and 60 what five six <laughs> gettysburg address he said we've met to determine whether this nation can long endure. In plainer words, we've been put to the test. We've been put to the test. Will it endure? And I'd say to Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Lincoln, we have come to a point now in 2015 where America is once again going to be tested as to whether we can endure. Will we last as a nation? Because you can be certain of this. There are millions of people in this country that absolutely cannot abide by what's happening to the culture around them. It will not endure the way it's been headed. God's got to change it. And I put, my, I put my part in right now in front of you, and I want you to understand this. Everything within my power, by the grace of God, until I'm gone from this earth, I will do to see to it that this nation stops the downward slide that it's in and turns around and comes back to God. Back in the, 60, back in the 80s, Back in the 80s, Jerry Falwell, who was the pastor of Thomas Road Baptist Church, 
Jerry Falwell was instrumental. I don't know if he was the, if he was the full driving force, but he was instrumental in starting in America what was called the moral majority. How many of you remember the moral majority? And why would why'd they do that? Because they wanted to do something that affected America. I think it's time for us to start praying that God will raise up somebody in the Christian community that will take the place of Jerry Falwell and once again stand up and call Christians to come together and do something as Christians to come together in this nation to turn it around for God. God is not concerned about what those nine justices say. He's concerned about what you say. He's far more concerned about how you react to what just happened this past Friday than he is the two senators from Tennessee or the governor of this state or any a politician in this country. He is far more concerned about how you respond to this shot across the bow. See how you respond. Start praying now for God to raise up a man that can pull him together in this country and stand up with millions behind him and say, enough is enough, enough is enough. How many would like to do that? You think it's worth it? And if the Lord comes before all that happens, hallelujah, go out of here shouting glory to God. But do what you can while you're here and, and do what you can to turn the light on the darkness. God bless you. Father, I've delivered my soul. I felt your presence with me, Lord. I've told them the truth. And Father, these people in this house this morning, Lord, they love you. God, there's people in here this morning, Lord, that lay their life down for you. No doubt in my mind at all. My Heavenly Father, there's somebody in this country. There's got to be somebody. Somewhere. Somebody that has the integrity. Somebody that has the, the influence that can rise up and say enough is enough. Like Nehemiah to go back and build a wall and in one hand a weapon and the other hand a trowel. Well, we have on one hand the weapon, which is the word of God, and the other hand the trowel. God, help us to start building again. Bless us now, Father. In thy holy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning, brother. What we got?